everyone, welcome to my channel. So my name is V. I am a fully qualified actuary uh, working in the risk function area in a life insurance company in Canada. So I started uh, this series, Get to Know an Actuary, in order to help you know more about the actual professions, like what do we do, where do we work, and just uh, feature various uh, professional um, their journey and uh, their path to become an actuary so that you understand more about the professions and can help you to decide whether this is the path for you. So I am in a way a life uh, actuary. So I got my designation through the Society of Actuaries and I pursued the EIM and Finance track. So today uh, I'm very excited to bring in uh, our guest uh, who is a PNC actuary uh, who pursued the path through the Casualty Actuary Society. Make sure you watch until the end of the episode for advices uh, for people who would like to pursue the actual career path as well as uh, how to get the first job uh, or internship. And if you have watched my previous uh, episode uh, for different conversation with other actuaries or other uh, actuarial recruit, uh, recruiting managers, you can see that they do say almost the same thing. So if you pay attention to these tips, I'm sure, and, and, and be prepared and actually implement them, uh, I'm sure that will be a positive result for you. So first, let's get to know Adil a little bit. So hi Adil, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm Adil Warani. I, uh, I graduated from University of Waterloo in uh, 2015, majoring uh, um, in actuarial science and statistics. Uh, not a surprise there. Uh, and uh, then I went uh, working uh, at the various companies. Uh, again, just to mention, I pursued the path of the PNC, so property and casualty, or in certain countries, it's known as general insurance. Uh, so whatever, whatever it's called. Uh, and uh, I started off at multiple PNC companies. I've uh, switched firms in the last five, six years, uh, getting exposure in personal pricing, uh, analytics, uh, data science, uh, uh, and recently I've been working uh, at Zurich Insurance, uh, most in the commercial lines, large account pricing. Uh, so definitely uh, my background is purely pricing. Uh, and uh, just a little bit other than my professional life, uh, one more thing, actually, I am a fellow for uh, Canadian uh, Actuarial, uh, uh, sorry, Casualty Actuarial Society. And uh, also on my personal life, I like uh, playing ping pong uh, professionally. And uh, and also I, I love mentoring students and uh, watching metrics. Yeah, that's a little about me. So everyone have different reasons to decide on their career path. So why did you choose to become an actuary in the first place? It's, uh, it's quite of a story, to be honest. Uh, and... Um, to initially when I was back in high school uh, and let me tell you right off the bat like uh, I was not born and raised in Canada so I was born and raised in Pakistan uh, and I moved to Canada for my undergraduate studies in 2010 so it was a big move not just to choose actuarial science but even to move countries to uh, where I don't have even a single person of family uh, to just pursue actuarial science here right so it had to be a lot of determination to be honest to get here so uh, my why or why did I choose that was uh, back in high school uh, I, I never was uh, like so much planned enough that what I want to pursue in university, but my brother who was two years younger than me uh, was uh, more prepared than I, I was. So uh, even though I was uh, two years older than him, he had already chosen his path to be an actuary uh, because he always loved math and uh, uh, he never excelled in uh, science, uh, same as me. And I thought uh, our profiles are so aligned. Uh, we like math uh, uh, and I don't know, I'm not planned enough. I don't know what I want to do with my career. Let's just be an actuary. So uh, I stole his idea and I'm like, okay, let's be an actuary uh, just because our profiles match and he has uh, done his research and he has come up with an actuary profile, then it, it will suit me too. So that's where I think it was... Um, it started off and it started off not in a planned way to be honest but uh i ended up coming to canada i ended up coming to waterloo and then i think that's when i really found out my why because I, I had multiple opportunities in which even though i made a decision back in high school without any thinking i could have given up uh, and chosen a different career uh, back in university uh, but i chose not to and the reason for that uh, i think that's where my why comes from is uh, when i realized how many business problems uh, actuaries could solve not just like what we traditionally are being taught to do or being told to do that uh, that actuaries are are responsible for let's say uh, what is a main a mainstream idea is that uh, whenever you tell someone you're an actuary they either relate you to the insurance companies that uh, you work at an insurance company or most of the time they don't even know what an actuary is for that matter and uh, for some individuals it's more either pricing uh, or either reserving 
uh, which is which is the broad broad branches of. But when I saw actuarial science, I saw it as a um, as, as as a way to make an impact in the world. And I can talk about it later in my other questions. But uh, that was my major why. My major determination is that it opens up your path to so many different platforms. Uh, some of them you don't even know at that point in time. And with time, just time tells that you know uh, uh, how much impact you can make with that analysis, not just uh, uh, pricing, reserving, or working in an insurance company. I really love that you say um, actuary can solve a lot of business problems. And sometimes we just think at the beginning that uh, the actuaries only work in insurance industry or certain uh, limited areas. But these days, uh, we can actually apply our skill and knowledge in a lot more areas. Uh, and it's just like how we can uh, convince other people in taking the opportunities to uh, solve those issues and uh, promote our actual profession more. So a lot of students ask me, uh, how can I decide between the society actuaries, the SOA, uh, versus the casualty actual society, the CAS? So how did you decide between the two and uh, end up with uh, choosing the CAS path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that also, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like life takes you to the path that, uh, which is meant to be yours, I, I feel. Uh, I could have easily ended up on the life side. Uh, a couple of things, uh, a couple of things happen. Uh, firstly, uh, as many, as even you, uh, we uh, and even other individuals would understand that back in university, when you graduate, you don't, a lot of times you don't make a choice uh, that the path is chosen for you because you, uh, you get a job in a particular company and that company, if it's a life insurance company, most likely at the end of the day, you will end up on the life path and, and vice versa. Um, so for me, it was a little bit of both, mostly driven by I got a job in, uh, in a PNC insurance company. Uh, but also before that, I took a few courses back in university, uh, which were mainly, as you would see, most universities are driven mainly by life courses, but there are only a one or two couple uh, PNC courses. And I, I ended up taking those courses. And that's when I realized a little bit of a challenge, which uh, uh, I personally felt worked for me, at least, was... Uh, uh, and, and just to elaborate that a little bit, uh, we, that what that challenge was and uh, what intrigued me more was uh, uh, just the fact that on the property and casualty side, uh, there are multiple dimensions you're looking at, like life insurance. I feel that you look at uh, the, the amount, and I'm just taking a basic life insurance product. Uh, you have, let's say, a life insurance. You know the amount of the policy. The only uh, only factor you're kind of predicting is when the person is going to die or the mortality rates. Whereas on PNC side, I was I was intrigued by the fact that uh, you don't know how much an accident is going to cost. So the, the 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 severity, what we call it, or the amount of an accident is unknown. First, that's a variable. If an accident is going to happen, similar to if the person is going to die, that is an unknown. And on top of that, how many times there are going to be an accident in a year? There could be one accident, there could be five accidents, there could be 10 accidents based on the driver attributes. Whereas in uh, life side, the person cannot die time 10 times, right? That person has to die only once, uh, at least so far, right? So uh, so that's why I think that intrigued me, those multidimensional variability, uh, which kind of intrigued me to learn more and, uh, and get into that sector. But as also I said that, a lot of it was also driven by the fact that I secured my first job in the PNC, but uh, a little bit of uh, interest was uh, also shown by uh, my understanding when I was back in university. Totally agree. I think I also chose to uh, follow the SOA track just because I'm, I was interested more in the enterprise risk management and corporate finance. So the SOA uh, gave me more options in that. But yes, like normally, I think if we ended up our first job or like the internship and stuff happened to be either life insurance company or the non-life insurance company, that can have a great influence on which path we would choose uh, afterwards. So can you tell us a little bit about your work, uh, your pricing's work? So what does a typical day or week look like for you? I'll just uh, kind of break that question down into two different parts. Uh, first one, I would be, uh, which is my more recent experience, which is uh, since last four or five months, I've been at uh, Zurich, uh, Canada, uh, which is on the commercial lines, uh, large account pricing, which I'm going to come on uh, in, in a couple of, in a couple of minutes. Uh, first, I want to talk about mostly or majority of my experience before Zurich. So uh, because that's majority of my experience so far uh, in, in the six years I've had after my university, uh, that was majorly on the personal lines pricing. So it was, uh, uh, if, if I want to call it for the layman, like in terms of when you get a car insurance, you get a property insurance, the premium you pay, uh, that's what like on the uh, on the pricing side of it that's what myself and my team was responsible for calculating uh making models on the back end so um and updating it uh and also on the other end um, a lot of these rates uh, for auto for property uh, not for not so much for the property but for the auto insurance in canada are regulated so uh we as an uh, insurance company cannot charge whatever we want starting tomorrow we need to what they call it file our rates uh, in our models um, get them approved 
and then we can use it. So there's a there's a bit of a lag, and that in, that kind of has its own challenges uh, of kind of uh, communication related because now you're not just creating a model and understanding it; you're also making sure you take this model and you explain it to these regulators, which sometimes are are not as tech savvy as uh, you would like them to be. So I think my day-to-day -day work and my personal lines was involved in doing these filings, what we call it, regulatory filings, uh, creating models, working with the data scientists, uh, uh, not per se as deep as them, like to take a deeper dive into the data, but more so working with them and understanding the analyses they were they were, they were were projecting and, uh, and, make, and giving that business sense. So that's where I think it actually comes into play is data scientists can tell you whatever variables are important. This is what have the model should look like. But as an actuary, you bring your skill set to uh, bring value to the table of whether that makes sense intuitively, whether that makes sense in a business sense, uh, whether uh, it would make sense for the shareholders, whether it will make sense for the policyholders, whether, whether, whether it will fly by the regulators and all that stuff. So that's what my normal day would look like. And a lot of times it would be doing pricing analyses, um, doing profitability analyses, which segments we are more profitable in and in which we are not. And uh, how can we strategically maneuver our book of business to a more profitable area and what can we do uh, to make the unprofitable area profitable by either taking price increases or uh, doing some segmentation changes. So that's what my personal insurance experience side would look like. Uh, whereas my uh, my commercial insurance uh, experience, which has been last four or five months at Zero Canada, is uh, is a little bit different because uh, on the personal lines, you you have a lot of data to start off with. Uh, you analyze, like you have a lot of credibility. You start off with, you can incorporate all the data you have for all the individuals and create a model based on that, which is what you call the exposure rating. Like you can exposure rate based on the different characteristics. Whereas on the commercial insurance side, each and every insurer is different, and uh, you only can use the loss experience of that insure, of that insured because one insured has multiple vehicles or multiple exposure. So we only, what we call loss rating, we only use their own losses to rate them. Uh, and there is a credibility rating based on um, how credible are the losses, and if it's a, if it's a, a new company, then we 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 gain like the industry data and all that stuff. But the experience is very different because uh, on the personal side, everything is set it up, templates are there, models are there. Everything you just have to do is uh, update the model or understand what's happening. But on the commercial side, a lot of times you just have to start from the scratch. Like you have to build it up from the scratch. A new customer comes into you. They have a fleet of 10,000 vehicles. Um, you don't have lost data. You make a lot of assumptions. There is a lot of uh, higher level layer limits involved, uh, reinsurance contracts, setting up captives. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a very different kind of uh, environment and a very different kind of role. Uh, nonetheless, I, I love it. And uh, I think it's just kind of uh, extending my more horizons, uh, broadening them uh, uh, for my own knowledge. So I know that you have been doing a lot of mentorship work. So can you tell us uh, a little bit more about your mentorship initiative? Uh, because I think that is a very great initiative that I've seen uh, back then. Even if we want to look for something, it's not like the resources out there. So it's great to see that there are more and more resources available for students nowadays. Uh, so first of all, uh... I've always been uh, big in giving back uh, to the community in whichever way we can. Um, as a as an international student coming in 2010, uh, I personally feel I faced a bunch of different challenges. Uh, I'm not saying anybody's challenges is bigger or less than the other. Everybody has their own challenges. I would say I had a different set of challenges than any other individual. Um, uh, let it be more financial, let it be more personal, let it be more emotional, or let it be just the mindset in, in particular. So uh, navigating through them uh, actually allowed me to gather a bunch of resources and uh, kind of incorporate a different mindset over, over the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, and even after university, uh, uh, the experiences that I've had kind of uh, allowed me to kind of understand what individuals need and maybe if I can uh, uh, incorporate those in any format uh, and get those to those individuals and let me tell you like everybody will make their own mistakes I understand that uh, if, even if I tell this uh, person a that this is the, this is what I this is the mistakes I made and you know uh, these are the resources you go here here okay they might not make the same mistakes as I did but they will make mistakes and that's just part of life what my goal in here is with the mentorship is to allow them to make their own mistakes which are not the same as mine make mistakes uh, create your own list of mistakes which are different than mine. And maybe somehow if, if you were intrigued by what I did, then uh, kind of transfer that to someone else. So it kind of goes on forever, you know, and, and no other individual ends up making the same set of mistakes 
previous 10 individuals has made first 10. So that's my, that's my goal, uh, not avoiding mistakes. No one can avoid mistakes. It's just part of life. And that's when uh, I was doing informal mentoring for the last four years after, uh, so right after graduation. Um, and it was more like one-off mentoring sessions here and there, whoever reaches out. And more recently it was uh, like, uh, I would say six, seven months back, I started a more formal mentorship program uh, in which uh, it's not only actuarial related, but it's also a lot of uh, mindset issues we deal with, a lot of uh, self-doubts, I call it, because a lot of these things uh, are, are are more uh, reason for why we are not where we are. Uh, like if I want to be an actuary, uh, I understand there's a technical part of it, but a lot of it has to do with the mindset. A lot of that has to do with what you're thinking, how you accomplish things, what you feel when you are not feeling good uh, and all that stuff. So when I started this program, the goal of that program is to uh, work with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis understand what they want to achieve, uh, figure out. And I ask a lot of questions to these mentees. Uh, sometimes that much that they get annoyed and they're like, I don't know what you're asking, but that's the, that's the reason that it works is because uh, I sometimes ask them to take a deeper dive and why they are not where they're supposed to be, what's stopping them. And then we set up goals for them. Uh, and then I'm their accountability partner. I tell them on a daily basis that, okay, this is your goal. We set in advance. Uh, and which is like, again, a smart goal and stuff, but how do you accomplish it? You have to be accountable to me. You have to message me. You have to call me whatever on a daily basis, tell me what you're doing. And I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold you accountable. And that's, that's been working good so far. Like, uh, over the last six to eight months, uh, I've helped, uh, as of now, uh, eight students to accomplish their goals, uh, and, uh, and get where they want to be. And that's just an amazing uh, feeling I would say. And my always goal is to kind of, uh, not just keep them with me for all the time. Like I just want this knowledge to spread and I just want to enable them. I say it. Uh, so it's like giving them some training and then, you know, letting them fly on their own. Uh, and I, I, I try my best to allow them to be able to be a mentor one day. So that's where, when I said that the list goes on, when they, they mentor someone else, they create a list or they create, they have an experience, which is not only theirs, but embedded with mine. And then they give that, give their mentee a list, which is the set of uh, mistakes I made and that they made. And now their mentee can make another set of mistakes, which they can forward to the next mentee. So that's my goal. Uh, sorry for being a little more elaborate, but uh, my goal is to kind of accomplish that part is kind of providing support to individuals and uh, making sure people make their own mistakes that are unique to them, uh, not something which someone else has already made. I really love that you actually focus on the mindset and the attitude in order to become an actuary. Because uh, yes, uh, you can pass exam and then become a fully qualified actuary. But in order to be like a good, well-rounded actuary or like to be uh, successful uh, on this path or any professional path, is our mindset, is our like uh, uh, work ethics uh, attitude in order to uh, work better and contribute uh, to help uh, solving business problems. So as a mentor, uh, do you have any advice for people who would like to pursue the actual profession? Well, uh, what advice do I have for people pursuing actual science? So uh, yes, I would say that it, it requires a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication. Uh, and I'm not saying that nobody, nobody has it from the start. Everyone develops it. So uh, don't be like, I don't have it or I don't have it in me to get it there. Or even if you have started the journey and you feel you have a lot of setbacks, don't feel that, you know, you don't have the, you just don't have it in you because nobody has it in them. They, they kind of create it for them, I would say. Uh, so I would say whenever you get into that, uh, stuck in that circle, I would say that you don't know how to get out, out of, ask for help. I think that's the, that's the major thing I would like to say is reach out, like, you know, um, reach out to go on LinkedIn, reach out to individuals, uh, like yourself, me, uh, myself, uh, there's so many other out there who are willing to help or willing to give some advice, uh, and, uh, and take advice from them. And, uh, and I would say most of the time, it's not because it's not in you. It's about the discipline required. It's about the commitment required, which you're not willing to give. And that's completely fine. I'm not saying that anything is wrong with that, not giving the commitment. It's just that then you have to figure out which area of your life you want to commit to. So it may be that actual science is not for you. Maybe you don't want to pursue something else, but just the heads up I want to give that actual science is definitely a lot about commitment. It's the journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, a lot of individuals uh, think that, uh, you know, they want to get it done in four years, three years. I've, I've even heard crazy people saying three years, two years. I'm like, this is not a, this is not a sprint. And that's where they burn themselves out. And uh, they're taking multiple exams in, a, in one sitting, uh, just trying to kind of beat the clock. Uh, and what that does, there's, it does two things. Uh, be that, uh, first of all, it definitely burns them out, but people around them, let's say if I had a friend who, who told me that he wants to write his exams in two years, 
it would freak me out too. It would, I would be like, wow, I, I think I need to pick up my battle too here because uh, this guy is taking it in two years and it stresses out everyone, right? Uh, so uh, first of all, if you are that individual, you're saying that you want to run at a sprint, I would say it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So break it down. And for an advice to an individual who is among these kind of individuals, who is kind of saying, uh, so they're among the group in which some of the individuals are saying, oh, they want to complete it in a sprint. I would tell you, don't stress out. I would say everybody has a journey. Uh, a fellow at an age 23, doesn't mean that he has a better life or he or she has a better life than a fellow at age 32. Like I personally feel everybody has their own track. Uh, everybody has their own, what I call it a timeline. Uh, and nobody is better than the other. It's just, they are following their own timeline. So that's the advice I would give to people following the path and uh, getting into the path that that's what you can expect. So I have always advised people that if they are interested in uh, a career or a career path or profession, um, especially the actual profession, um, it is good to have at least an internship or co-op or the first job in this field to see whether you actually like it because the path to become an actuary is very long with all of the exams and so on. So do you have any specific advice to uh, for people who would like to um, get their first job or first internship? The individuals uh, who are looking for the first job, uh, and, and I, I hold a lot of sessions for these, and I, I tell one thing which you have to remember is that the, whenever I talk to a student, uh, they always ask me, how do I get a job? How, how do I end up getting an interview? Or how even if I get an interview, how do I end up kind of closing that deal, right? Uh, I always tell, or how do I stand out? Actually, that's one of the questions. Like, how do I stand out? Because there are 100 candidates. Uh, one job is available. How do I stand out? And my response to that is always the same, not for any actual job, any job in particular. You have to own up your story. Like, you have your own story. Like, you have your own profile. You, when I say your story, like, you have a unique story in terms of why you became an actuary what was your story like i told you mine at the start right well how how i turned out to be an actuary you have your own journey of writing exams of being in university uh what intrigues you what does not what what makes you what interests you what does not and all that stuff so tell that tell that to the employer and i think that's where you will stand out because you know no other person and i say again no other person has the same journey and the same story exactly as you and that's what makes you stand out and a lot of times people just miss that they try to an interview i've interviewed a lot of people i have actually mentored a lot of people and uh, when i do mock interviews and i do real interviews um, a lot of times you ask them uh, why should i hire you or uh, what stands you apart uh, and what the answer is uh, let's say the, the best answer is a quick learner uh, i am even though i don't know i'll learn it or i i, I can code in here uh, i can price this way i understand but this is very generic i want to know what your story is like so why why you right and and that's where i feel everybody can stand out it's not that one individual can stand out Everybody, as long as we start owning our stories and telling that is thing, I think that's that's one of the advice I will give to uh, to each and every individual. And one more thing, sorry we for getting a little long in there. One more thing I would like to say in there is um, it requires a lot of vulnerability when you when you share your story. You are being vulnerable. Uh, a lot of times, sometimes the story you feel that you are embarrassed for uh, it did not work out for you. Sometimes might it, it might not work because you might think that you know if I say it out, what this person is going to feel for me. And I'm not saying 100% of the time it would work, but I can assure you 95% of the time, 95 out of 100 times when you go for an interview and you tell your story, doesn't matter whatever it is, it creates connection. Because I'll tell you, vulnerability always creates connection. Like it will, it will tell the other person that you're really open to them and it will kind of make other person step down their walls as well. And that's where I think the real change happens. I do think that uh, being vulnerable is actually being brave. So it requires us to be open and share our story in order to make the connections like you share. So those are definitely very great tips. So do you figure out what was the common tip or advice that everyone was saying about how to help you to get your first job or internship? If so, drop it in the comment section. So in the next episode, I will would uh, go into more details about the pricing uh, model assumption or the skill set and uh, different uh, software applications that a pricing actually, especially in general insurance field, use. So once again, I hope this video is helpful for you to learn more about the actual profession, what we do and whether uh, this is interesting for you and uh, you'll be interested in pursuing this career Pet. So I wish you another happy productive week ahead and have any questions let me know and I will see you in the next episode. Bye!